it's my pleasure to present to my colleagues in Saudi Arabia what we understand about uh, COVID-19. Of course, the information is uh, evolving. Uh, things are changing rapidly. Uh, and what I talk about today may change uh, in the next few weeks, depending on what we learn about uh, this disease. And uh, what uh, evidence uh, we will have. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to uh, start by saying that uh, most of the information that I'm going to present today is based on the uh, uh, article that was uh, published in the Intensive Care Medicine by Professor uh, Gattinoni. And uh, this is based on uh, their uh, experience uh, with those patients in Italy uh, the presentation and the manifestation of uh, the disease. And uh, it is rather complicated. Uh, we have uh, issues at multiple uh, levels. But uh, the problem starts by uh, entrance of the virus uh, into the cells through uh, the uh, ACE2 receptors. After uh, this entrance, uh, multiple uh, uh, steps occur in the uh, cells uh, for replication of the virus and the release. This is associated with uh, an inflammatory response by the uh, uh, immune system of the body. Uh, starts uh, from antigen presentation and then uh, provoking uh, two different types of uh, immunity, the cellular uh, immunity and the uh, immoral immunity. With this process, uh, there are a number of uh, cytokines that are released, mainly the interleukin-6 and other cytokines that have direct effect on the uh, lungs by uh, causing acute lung injury. We know that the virus can affect multiple organs in the body, mainly in the lungs, <clears throat> because the uh, S2 receptors are present in those organs. So the lungs are uh, number one uh, uh, affected by the virus. Uh, and then we have S2 receptors in the heart. And that's why we have uh, cardiac injury, direct cardiac injury by the virus. The receptors are also present in the kidneys, and we learned that 15% of those patients would have uh, acute uh, kidney injury that might be related directly to the virus and not part of the uh, syndrome that is associated with this disease. But it also could be part of the fluid status, especially if we are drying those patients too much. We learned also that uh, ACE2 uh, receptors are affected in the brain, and that's why we have uh, a cognition problem and uh, the perception of shortness of breath uh, is uh, very uh, low. Uh, so you can see the association between the amount of hypoxemia and the patient's symptoms. Uh, many times the patient comes to you in emergency room or in the intensive care unit, Oh. And uh, he's not recognizing that he has an increased work of breathing. And uh, at the same time, his auto-saturation is in the 70s or 80s. We've seen different uh, levels of uh, delirium. In addition to uh, anosmia or uh, loss of uh, taste or smell uh, uh, senses. Uh, and this has been described more and more in uh, different reports. The S2 receptors are also present in the testicles, uh, so we don't know if uh, we're going to have any uh, uh, issues uh, later on uh, related to involvement of these uh, uh, receptors in the testicles or not. This is a complicated slide, but I'm going to simplify it because you all know that we have two different uh, types of S2 uh, enzymes, uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme, you have the ACE1 and ACE2. And uh, we're talking here, talking here about ACE2, and that is represented in green color. Everything is uh, in red is ACE1. 
it's very important to know that they have different effects on the lung parenchyma and uh, the, uh, uh, the consequences of activation of those receptors. So the ACE2 is actually converting angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 1 and 9, and it's also uh, responsible for converting angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1 and 7. At the same time, we have <clears throat> this angiotensin 1 and 1, 7. They both uh, have an effect on receptors. We call them AT2 or angiotensin 2, and the other one is mass. Angiotensin 1, 7 also is uh, uh, affecting the receptors called MRGD along with other compounds under the effect of ACE2. So what you need to know is <laughs> the uh, stimulation of those receptors in green, green color will lead to the following. Number one, vasodilatation. Number two, anti-proliferation. Number three, anti-inflammation. And number four, anti-fibrosis. So you would expect that if we block those receptors, what we will have is vasoconstriction, proliferation, inflammation, and fibrosis. However, what we see is not vasoconstriction, and we'll talk about that. If you see on the other side, the consequences of stimulation of the S1 receptors, the angiotensin 4 and the angiotensin 1, which is under the effect of whatever converts uh, in the angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 by the S1, and then goes to stimulate these two receptors here. You will see that the effect of stimulation of these receptors is exactly the opposite of the green color. Vasoconstruction, proliferation, inflammation, and profibrosis, except for the uh, AT4 that also causes vasodilatation. So what we think is happening is imbalance. The level of vasoconstriction versus vasodilatation de is dependent on the number of receptors that are present, whether they are uh, overrepresented or underrepresented uh, in the, uh, in, in the par lung parenchyma. So what we learned is that the final effect is actually vasodilatation. And I'm going to start from here to understand this better. So the main pathology that we have in the lungs is vasodilatation. So we have uh, the vessels are dilated and we're talking about only the pulmonary vasculature. So in the initial phase where we don't have much of the infiltrates yes, yet, in the, uh, in the lung parenchyma, the alveoli relatively will be normal. They have a normal ventilation. However, we have an increased perfusion secondary to the vasodilatation. That's why the disease is mainly causing what we call low VQ mismatch. And the low VQ mismatch is not because of the low ventilation. It is because of the increased perfusion. In other words, we're saying that the main pathology is dysregulation of pulmonary vasculature. And that's why I say the, the imbalance between the S1 and S2 causing this dysregulation of pulmonary vasculature. And what we learned also, because if you have a hypoxemia, what happens usually is that vasoconstriction. However, with this disease, there is no vasoconstriction. There's a polishment of hypoxic vasoconstriction. And in other words, we can say that it is pulmonary vasoplasia. So this will lead to hypoxemia. And hypoxemia will result into an increased work of breathing for the patient where the transpulmonary pressure will be increased. The patient will start breathing deeply he wants to get more tidal volume. He wants to improve his hypoxemia. Of course, he's not aware of that. And what we learn also that because of the neurotropism of the virus, 
there's an increased respiratory drive and the patient is breathing deeper. And that will lead also to more work, increased work of breathing. The increased work of breathing will result into an increased transpulmonary pressure, which is the difference between the intratracheal or intraalveolar pressure and the intrathoracic pressure. And we learned from our understanding of ARDAs that the more driving pressure, the more transpulmonary pressure, the more injury to the lung in, in, the, in the form of what we call patient self-inflicted lung injury. So <clears throat> this abnormalities here will lead to increased workup of breathing for the patient, which may lead to patient self-inflicted lung injury. But at the same time, the uh, virus itself, as a result of the inflammatory cascade that is, is uh, generated at the lung level, we have also alveolar injury added to the self-inflicted lung injury because of the cyto cytokines that are released here. And then we'll end up with a picture that is very similar, very similar. I'm not saying it's an ARDS. It is an ARDS-like picture. Because what we learned is that not, not all the uh, criteria for the Berman's criteria is fulfilled, mainly for the time, because we've seen those patients actually coming to us early on in the hospital, staying more than seven days, and then they get this lung injury. In the Berman's criteria, it has to, to happen within the first uh, seven days of the illness. So the other abnormality, and, and before I move to that, actually, if we have a low perfusion here because of the lung edema that we have, of course, the lung weight will be higher and the VQ mismatch will be much more lower. And then the low VQ mismatch will be because of the decreased ventilation now. But at the same time, we still have the vasodilatation that is caused by the initial insult on the lungs. Now it is <clears throat> over the past few weeks, we learned more and more about certain type of patients uh, that having uh, an, a, a change in the VQ mismatch where we have a high VQ mismatch, uh, where now we have the ventilation is still normal. However, the perfusion is decreased and the perfusion is decreased because of micro and macro thrombi. We uh, have a thrombosis at the level of the lung vessels, where we uh, have a low perfusion here, causing dead space disease. Areas of the lungs that are still ventilated, however, they are not perfused. So in a single patient, you may see that the patient has alveolar lung injury, along with micro or macro thrombosis, or you will see the vasodilatation mainly without lung injury, along with the micro or macro throm thrombi. And if the patient uh, continue to have increased work of breathing, he may transform from this form into this form. And you probably all seen the different chest X-ray presentations that we have seen in those patients. Uh, and most of those patients in the early phase in the low VQ phase, <clears throat> we've seen focal opacities of peripheral distribution. And uh, these focal opacities are seen as a ground glass uh, opacities on the CT scan, as we see in the next, uh, as we will see in the next slide. In terms of uh, uh, if the patient progressed into, into the uh, very low VQ uh, mismatch uh, state, at that time, you would see that those bilateral infiltrates are increased. Uh, we have uh, consolidation. We have areas of atelectasis. It is ARDS-like picture. And this is what we see typically in ARDS. And of course, you all know that there are no specific signs most of the time for the pulmonary uh, impoli. However, you may be able to see in, in some of the cases wedge shape infarcts uh, that are uh, giving you a hint that this patient may have macro uh, thrombosis. And this is on the CT scan. 
what you see is <clears throat> the ground glass appearance of these infiltrates, and this is typical, as you see, they are at the periphery of the lungs. And this is in the low VQ uh, state, in the initial state where it is only vasodilatation. And if you estimate the shunt fraction to the gasless fraction, so the gasless fraction is would, would be this areas here. This is has no gas. So and the shunt fraction is the areas where the the blood is shunted away, and that is because of the vas vasodilatation. You would see it is typically above a very high, more than one. It is typically around three. And in the study by Gattinoni, it was estimated to be three plus minus two. So it is actually above one. However, when it moves to when patients move to the very low VQ mismatch, where we we have this viso, this consolidation in the lung parenchyma, similar to the uh, ARDS uh, patients, the shunt fraction to the gasless fraction will be around 1 or 1.25 exactly in this uh, study that they've done. And <clears throat> this is a, a CT scan of a patient who has, as you see, ground glass uh, uh, opacities along with some atelectasis, consolidation. But at the same time, you, will, you see here a macro thrombus in the uh, pulmonary artery caused by the uh, increased uh, thrombosis for those patients. So this way, and if we keep the same understanding of this different pathologies that we have in the lungs, uh, the low VQ, the very low VQ, and the high VQ, we can identify different phenotypes. And those phenotypes have been named by the same study by Gattinoni that it is a phenotype L, in the very low VQ uh, state. And why it is very, uh, phenotype L? L stands for low. And those patients do not have, it is only vasodilatation. they do not have lung edema. They don't have an increased lung weight. So the elastins, which is the opposite of the compliance, is low, which is normal. Low meaning do not, do not is not lower than normal, it is low. Uh, com as, as compared to the high elastance in the other phenotype. So we have here low elastance, and as we mentioned, the VQ is low. The ventilation to the perfusion, because of the increased perfusion, it is low. Since we don't have too much lung water, then the uh, lung weight is also low. And if we don't have lung water, lung exud exudates, lung infiltrates, so there is nothing to recruit. You're not going to be able to recruit this lung. It is all already open. So that's why we've seen those patients with low recruitability. You try to recruit a lung, but there is nothing to recruit. And at the same time, why are we going to give those patients higher PEEP? They're not going to respond to higher PEEP because PEEP is actually a recruitment maneuver, but it's persistent on the lung, uh, on the ventilator. So those patients, they usually, do not require high or higher PEEP. They usually require only low PEEP. And that's why we called, or they called this phenotype as phenotype L. However, those patients, as we said, they have an increased respiratory drive. And we learned that you will, you will see when you, see, you will start seeing more and more patients, they will require a lot of sedation actually to control their respiratory drive. And you need to assess whether your patient has an inspiratory drive. This is very in important in the management of the patient. So the patient here with a low elastance will have hypoxemia, and then he will increase his work of breathing. And it, you need to evaluate whether this work of breathing is increased or not. How would you do that? The best way is to put esophageal monitor and measure the intrathoracic pressure so you will know the, uh, whether the patient is generating huge minus uh, 15 or more centimeter of water in terms of the intrathoracic pressure. Of course, if the patient is not intubated, that would be the transpulmonary pressure. And anything below minus 15, which is minus 20, minus 25, is associated with an increased work of breathe. 
breathing. However, we, we cannot do this, and it is not available in most of the time. If you have a central line placed in the IJ or in the subclavian, you may be able to see the large swings in the central line waves, in the CBV, central venous uh, pressure waves, in, uh, in the tracing. And that would be an indirect uh, indicator of uh, increased uh, uh, intrathoracic uh, pressure. I'm sorry, it's decreased intrathoracic pressure and increased transpulmonary pressure. Now, I mean, most of the time you're left with your clinical uh, judgment and clinical evaluation to see whether your patient has is exerting effort to uh, uh, get this uh, uh, tidal volume and uh, you would be left with using of accessory muscles, the respiratory rate, the depth of the uh, breath that he's taking. And as I said, the patient may not be aware that he's actually doing that increased work of breathing for him. So in most of the time, you need to rely on the uh, evaluation at the bedside where uh, you're going to make that decision yourself. Now, if the patient is intubated, because those patients, not necessarily that they are not intubated, we try to manage those patients, but if the patient is intubated, you have what we call the P.1 or the pressure in the 0.1 seconds the first point, one seconds, how much pressure is generated in the intrathoracic uh, uh, cavity. This is an indication of the increased respiratory drive. And in fact, you will see that most of the time, this pressure is around uh, more than four. We like it to be between one and four. If the pressure is more than four, that patient still having an increased respiratory drive. And we're using this pressure to see whether this patient is ready for extubation or not, or for SPT or not. Now, if that patient has an increased respiratory drive, increased work of breathing, he may go into the other phenotype, which is phenotype H. And in the phenotype H, pulmonary edema, uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema exudates uh, all this uh, uh, evidence of uh, ARDS-like picture uh, is, uh, are seen uh, in this uh, phenotype here. So the elastance will be high. The uh, shunt from the right to the left will be high. The long weight will be high because of the long water. And those patients will have higher recruitability and they will respond to high PEEP on the ventilator. So that's how you differentiate between those patients who have phenotype L and phenotype H. However, I want you to know that it is not going to be where uh, the patient will transform from phenotype L all of a sudden to phenotype H. It's going to be a process. It's going to be uh, a huge spectrum of abnormalities between the phenotype L and phenotype H. So you will see that most of the times like patients are in between and they are progressing from phenotype L to phenotype H and then you will be able to apply different uh, uh, event management strategies. Now, in terms of the increased uh, coagulation for those patients, and this is what we call sepsis-induced coagulopathy. And you, you've probably seen that most of those patients have indicators of increased uh, coag co coagulation. The D-dimers level are very high. The fibrinogen levels are high you will see a prolongation of PT, BTT, and INR. And we've seen different reports about platelets. You know, typically in my experience, uh, limited to almost 100 patients with uh, COVID so far, you know, I've, I'm not seeing thrombocytopenia uh, very often. However, I've seen it in few cases. So a varying degree of thrombocytopenia with this increased coagulopathy. Now, this will be helping us in determining what is the management strategy. If you understand the pathology this way, you would be able to understand how you're going to manage those patients. So if you see only pulmonary vasodilatation, of course, the first question would be asked, can we have a pulmonary vasoconstructor? The answer is there's only one medication that is not FDA approved. 
and uh, we don't use it clinically. So we don't have a vasoconstrictor that we can use on the lungs. Those patients, if they respond to the oxygen, would be good, excellent. Try not to use BiPAP for those patients because you don't want to increase the, the transpulmonary pressure for those patients. So if you, if you have high flow oxygen or oxygen at uh, 10, 15 liters without having the uh, very high flow oxygen because you don't want to generate aerosols for those patients, fine. If they need, require some CPAP is, is preferred over BiPAP because you don't want to put any pressures. So just put that CPAP on those patients and see if they improve. And if you do that, it has to be in a negative pressure room and it has to be time limited. You have to observe the patient and we're talking about hours, not days, where you observe those patients, if they're not doing fine, you need to get them to get intubated. If they get intubated, uh, you don't need to use four to six ml. You have a freedom to go up higher on the tidal volume because it's not ARDS yet. You can do it eight ml per kg uh, for those patients easily and you should not get into uh, trouble. And the PEEP, as we said, it's going to be between eight and 10. You will not require higher PEEP than uh, 10 for those patients. It is very important that those patients, and we're talking about before intubation, to see if they can do self-directed proning, self-proning for those patients. And some patients may get better, but if you understand the pathology, you would ask the question, why do they get better? You know, those patients do not have lung edema. So what am I shifting? We are shifting the blood flow. We're shifting the blood flow from the dependent areas to the non-dependent areas when we flip them, actually. So it would be the other way around. So it is based on the gravity, based on the pressures. We're flipping the or ch changing the flow among the different uh, lung uh, segments. So they may improve with proning, but not necessarily. So it, you, it, that's why I said here trial of proning. If oxygenation is improved at that time, you would continue with proning and uh, we do it for two hours uh, at least and uh, whenever the patient is able to do it. And this is self-proning. You would be questioning why are we going to do nitric oxide or uh, prostaglandins? It is a trial. Maybe the, our other areas are still vasoconstructed. I'm not sure if they're going to help. Based on the pathology, I don't think they should help in this disease here. Now, if the work of breathing is increased based on your assessment, you need to intubate those patients earlier. So when we talk about early versus late, it is all dependent on the work of breathing. And then you intubate those patients early if the work of breathing is high for those patients. As I said, they would require high level of sedation and they may require to be paralyzed too. If they move into the phenotype uh, uh, H uh, uh, type of uh, disease, at that time, this is similar to ARDS. The management will be similar to what we've done, except I don't think they need a very high P. And the reason for that is because of the hemodynamic effects. We've seen that those patients with a very high P have a very high hemodynamic abnormalities and this affecting the functions of the other organs. So we try not to increase the PEEP more than 16. The tidal volume should be four to six as for protective lung strategy. They may benefit from different modes of ventilation such as airway pressure release ventilation, and they may uh, improve with recruitment maneuvers. They may improve with proning positions. And in general, we say conservative fluid strategy. However, this should be guided by the hemodynamic profile of the patient. You don't want to dry those patients to the level that they are hypovolemic, and then they end up with acute kidney injury or other abnormalities. And the question would be for the high VQ, whether we should anticoagulate those patients or not. And here what we're doing is we are anticoagulating anyone for sure if the D-dimers above 3,000 uh, and questionable if the D-dimers above 1,000. So <clears throat> this is evolving also, but in general, it looks like we're going to need anticoagulation for those patients before they get into trouble. We've seen that there is a high rate of clotting of the quinton catheter or the vascular, vascular cath for those patients and higher rate of clotting on ECMO also. So with this, I would like uh, you to know only that while we've seen different uh, courses of the diseases, 
uh, of the disease. Uh, we've seen the uh, hyperacute uh, cases where the patient uh, presents with severe hypoxemia and respiratory distress, leading to immediate intubation and mechanical ventilation and possibly death. Uh, and then we've seen those cases where they present with indolent course, they are improving with moderate hypoxemia, it may take days, two weeks before they get better. Certain percentage of those patients get better and certain percentage they have a biphasic uh, course where they start indolent, uh, in terms of the course, and then typically on day number five and seven, the patient gets worse. In fact, actually, ha yesterday I had two patients whom I thought they would be uh, discharging from the uh, ICU, where uh, everything is improving, patients alert, awake, and uh, comfortable. Uh, number of uh, liters needed uh, for the oxygen is like four to five liters, and then. I, uh, at night, they both got uh, worse and uh, they went into severe disease where bilateral infiltrate seen on the chest x-ray patients needed to be intubated. As I said, this is typically happening between five and seven days. So it is biphas biphasic course, initial indolent course, followed by acute deterioration and hyperinflation. So I think with this, I uh, uh, probably touch on uh, everything except medications and I will leave Dr. Nisreen, uh, to, to, to teach us more about this different steps uh, of the virus and where we're going to target the virus in terms of medical management. Thank you very much.